know, what I want to know is, is how, how does one get involved in doing rock work as a woman? Do you really, really want to know? Or do you just want the rehearsed response that I always give? What would happen if we chose to really tell the truth about ourselves? Like if we really, really just told the real truth of our lives. I'm not saying that it's true. I'm saying that it's my truth. You're listening to him. The next few days after this event, I have to say, I think I can identify with how those sharks that hang upside down that get just gutted with a fucking knife. I kind of felt like they did, I think. I couldn't. There was like there were no words that I could really express to explain how I was feeling. And I told a few friends, I had reached out to a few friends and of course the guys at work and everything, but across the board, everyone was trying to tell me to completely just cut it off, you know, stop, detach, don't respond, no more, it's done. And they were all kind of pissed and, you know, thank God for Joey. I love that boy. We got out of the truck one night after work and he came all the way around and he just stood there with me and just looked at me. And I kind of just kept saying, I don't, I don't know, Joey, I don't know, I don't know what to do. And he he just kept hugging me, you know, and I just, you know, it, it was like I couldn't, I couldn't voice anything and I couldn't speak about anything because I had this whole other thing going inside of myself around the fact that I had chosen one person, one person out of the entire internet collection, I guess you'd say, I picked, see, and I flashed all the way back to therapy lady saying to me, Jill, when are you going to pick? You let everybody pick you. You know, you just let anybody that comes down the pike pick you. And, you know, she was right back then. I did. I did let anybody that come down the pike pick me because I didn't have any fucking self-worth. But with this situation, you know, I picked. And I knew that I was responsible for this. And I knew on some creepy fucking level that I had created this. If we create our own reality, well, what the fuck is this? So I was having this battle. I was having this like internal war in myself. Because every time that I would start to cry or melt down with another person, then I would have this other side say, you fucking did it. You created this. You know, What the fuck are you doing on the fucking internet? I mean, didn't you learn your lesson from fucking Red Devil? I mean, this was the kind of stuff that was going on inside of me. 
And I, I didn't have any compassion for myself. It was a like total, like, just, I was just reeling. And then when the people, the friends that, that knew about Helen and kind of knew Helen, they were, were trying to talk to me and help me. I was, I guess I would just put up my defenses because I, I could not explain it. I couldn't explain what was happening inside of myself and this pain, this, this rippage, this just total rippage. And I have experienced some death and some trauma and lots of devastation in my life. But this one was on a different level. And I still, it's like I still find, uh, find it challenging to put language around it. About, you know... Four or five days went on, and I kept receiving text and email, and I would respond very vaguely, and the texts were very, um, how are you? How are you feeling today? I'm glad you're feeling better. You know, it was really sterile, and then it was like fucking Super Bowl Sunday, who gives a fuck about that but anyway I get a, a message about the Super Bowl or you know figured Super Bowl Sunday you might be into football and I'm like who is this see in my mind I'm knowing that this is not or is it well I'd say about the second day maybe the second it might have been the night of I've, I'm very uh Confused on those first couple of days, those first 72 hours were very, very confusing to me. And uh, my friend Eva came over. She had printed some stuff from her printer for me and was going to drop it off. I had told her about uh, Helen very briefly. I had told her that I had met someone and... uh, I mean, I told her a little bit. We actually had gone to dinner, and I had told her a little bit more and shown her pictures, and she was saying, I'm really happy for you, and she was very sincere in that. And uh, But she dropped, she was dropping these, these papers off, and uh, she came up the sidewalk, and I was standing on the front porch, and I just started, I started like almost hyperventilating, and she looked at me, and she said something, and then she said, are you okay? And I go, no. And she was like, what is it? I said, I have to tell someone 100% truth. I have to tell somebody the 100% truth, or I'm going to lose it. She was like, I could tell she was kind of like, what is going on? And She stood there for a minute, and I just started, I don't even remember what I said, but I started trying to explain, and I tried to tell her, and and she said, hold on, hold on, hold on a minute. I'll be right back. And she went down to her car, and I think, you know, she came back, and she said, let's go in the house, and she had canceled her plans, and I don't think in the whole 22 years of knowing this person that I've ever seen her cancel some plans for me. And, uh, but I think she knew that something was really wrong with me because I've been a rock. No pun intended. I've always been the fucking strong one. But this one was taking my ass down. And we came in and I said, can I just start from the beginning? Because I had to, it's like I had to create a process. I mean, you can read books and you can listen to all your fucking tapes and all your CDs and all your blogs and all your podcasts. You can listen to things a million hours. But to actually be able to work through something, I don't know how. 
But this was something that innately started happening was I said, can I just start from the beginning? And I went all the way through my phone and I, I narrated a story to her with all of these pictures, all the photographs, because I have a million texts and a million emails but I couldn't even look at that. I couldn't look at that. And the pictures were hard enough to look at. But I thought, okay, let me just go down the line here. And, and in this timeline, and I could kind of go from, you know, September, October, November, December, January, February. You know, I was able to to go through the timeline with the pictures. And, it, and the picture would tell me, like, what was happening at that time. And she was so gracious. She sat and she listened. And at one point, I don't even know how this happened. But at one point, I wasn't sure if she was sitting on my couch or if she was not sitting on my couch. I didn't know if I was imagining her sitting on my couch or if she was really sitting on my couch, I lost touch with reality for a few seconds. And it happened two different times during that, that evening. And this was starting to scare me because I'm a pretty grounded person. But this was way out of my league. This was way out of my league. And she sat and she listened and, you know, she was very sweet and, uh, and then she left. And so I just continued to, to, you know, try to understand this and I couldn't write, I couldn't read, I couldn't really do anything. I felt like a real zombie and when I would get in my truck, you know, music would come on and this song, Different This Time by Cornelia Murr. That is the Helen of Greece theme song. And all of a sudden, hearing it with these ears instead of the pre-scam ears, I, I couldn't, it was like making me nauseous. I thought I was going to have to pull over and throw up. And the night, like the Saturday night before all this had happened, Helen had sent me that song by Earth, Wind, and Fire called Love's Holiday. She always sent these like she, they, them, not sure, she would always send me these like older ver these older songs and i mentioned that early on but this song when i listened to it that saturday night she says i'm in the kitchen cooking listen to this i wanted to send it to you kisses and uh and i remember playing it and i remember how happy that it made me listening to those words My life, it did a 360 really quick. Well, I had not responded, you know, before before I had even responded at all. I'm, I'm really still confused on my timelines with this, but I didn't respond, I didn't respond, I didn't respond, you know, right after the beginning and I, the head injury and all that. And one morning, she, you know, like I said, was very persistent. Are you okay? I need to hear from you. So this, this one morning, it was Tuesday morning. I remember it was a Tuesday. And she, she texted and said, are you up? Can I call you? Please, I need to know you're okay. And so I picked up my phone and I texted and I said, you can call me. And so about 20 minutes later, my phone rang and it was her. 
And I just answered kind of low and I go, hello. She goes, oh my God, I've been so worried about you. Are you okay? And I said, well, yeah, uh, it's just been real confusing. I said, I just, uh, you know, I, I hurt my head really bad and I, I don't, uh, I don't know. I just have been really confused and, and kind of sad and stuff. And, and, uh, and I just, you know, I didn't, I felt real bad, Helen. I felt real bad, you know, that I couldn't, that I couldn't help you out, uh, financially. She goes, oh my God, oh my God, stop. Oh my God, babe. She said, I had no business asking you that. I had no business. What am I like entitled? I feel like I was, I was to have been being entitled or something. Like I had some right to ask you for, you know, money like that. I feel so horrible. I just, I felt so stuck and I just didn't know what to do, babe. And I said, uh, it's okay. I said, I understand, you know, and, and uh, I would I would totally help. You know, I would. Oh, yes, I know. I know, babe. I know you would. And I said, well, um, can I ask you a question? She says, of course. I said, like, do you need me to go down to your, uh, your place in Charleston and, like, check on anything? I mean... She says, no, it's all fine, babe. I've got everything under control. And I said, well, when do you think you're going to be able to come back? I don't know. It's going to be a while. I've got to work this out. I've got to work this mess out. And I said, uh, well, I said, it's, you know, I was just really looking forward to you coming back. And I know you got to do what you got to do. And, and part of me, see, was kind of like I was I was kicking into this, uh, the unconditional love place. I was really trying to just be like, okay, another human cannot affect the way you feel. Another person's response and words cannot affect the way you feel unless you allow it to and I was trying to keep that inside of me so I could just talk and I said well you know I know that it's your business and you got to do what you got to do because I get that you know I understand business and I understand you know I have to to work a lot of times and a lot of times people don't understand that in me they feel like I should just be able to drop what I'm doing and come do stuff with them or whatever I said but I get it and I go you know what Helen and she said what and I said to be honest with you I said I was just really looking forward to you teaching me how to ride a horse and I said you know I uh I've never ridden a horse before and I said, did I ever tell you my one attempt to ride a horse? And she said, no. And I said, well, back in the 90s, I said, this girl, this friend of mine had come back from the army and she got stationed at Fort Hood down in Texas. And I had told her at the landscape company that we worked at years prior to her even going in the army we were talking one day about horses, and I said I'd never ridden a horse. And she was like laughing at me. You've never ridden a horse? I was like, no. And I said, uh, she goes, why? And I said, I just never really had an opportunity, and my mom was scared of horses, and I just didn't ever really, I wasn't ever around them that much. And I said, you know, if I ever did ride a horse, I said, I would want that horse to be blonde. And my friend was laughing. She goes, blonde? I go, you know, like one of those, like, uh, I don't know, like an Appaloosa or a uh, Palomino. I don't even know the right names. But I just know I've seen them with, like, blonde hair or, like, a blonde mane and a blonde tail. I just thought they were real pretty. And I said, and I would want to ride on the beach. Well, so my friend, she, like, surprises me. And says, you know, come down to Houston and 
I've got the surprise. And so I flew down to Houston and we took a rental car and we went to Galveston. And we were going to stay at this place. And the next day, she goes, okay, we got to be somewhere. Come on. And we go down and we're driving. And we pull up to the beach. And we look down. And on the beach, there's this little group of horses and some people. And she started laughing. I go, what are you doing? And she goes, come on, you'll see. And so we go down. And uh, there was the blonde horse. And the man was going to help me get up on the horse. And they were going to show me how to ride this horse. And I'm, you know, and I said, uh, got on it and everything. And we start going. And I said, the horse's name was Tucson. I'll never forget. And all of a sudden, that horse turned around and, no kidding, bit a hunk out of my calf. Just clamped down on my calf. And I, like, screamed. And they were like, what? And I go, the horse is biting me. And we got off the horse and they got me off and I was, you know, and I'm telling this to Helen, a.k.a. I don't know. And she's like, oh, my God. She goes, oh, my God, babe. She goes, I I have missed you so much. And I said, you've missed me so much. And I have not talked to you in so many days. And I said, I know. And here's what's so fucked up about this. When I was listening to her voice and heard her laugh and heard her just so in tune to that story and everything, I felt like somebody gave me a good old shot of morphine. I got such relief All that anxiety and all that shock and all that shit that was in my body dissipated. It was gone. And I was like really confused. Like what happened? Like what? And then I realized that part of me was right back with her. I was right back in that vibrational energy of that person, whoever that person is. And then I said, Helen, if you could do anything, anything today, anything in the world, what would it be? And she quickly answered, I would finish my work here and finish this project and I would be back there as soon as possible. And I said, that's such a good answer. And I asked her how her back was and she'd been having some trouble and I told her a little bit about chiropractic. It was kind of like I was reaching Because, see, I didn't want her to hang up, see. I didn't want her to go. I didn't want her to go. I knew that this was it. I knew it. And I think she knew it. And we had this final little moment. And she said, "Uh, okay, baby girl. Because sometimes she called me that, which was really interesting. She says, you know, you uh, you take good care and I will be thinking of you and I just really, your health has to come first and, and I just, uh, I really hope that you're okay and you feel much better. And I said, okay. And I said, uh, you know where I'm at. And I said, you know, when you come back here, you know how to find me. And she says, yes, I do. And then we said goodbye. And we hung up the phone. And I had to go to work. And see, it just, it just, it just brought it all back again. It brought it all back again. It, it, it's like, okay, if you really want to punish yourself, won't you go play that song, Jill, different this time by Cornelia Murr? Won't you go play some of these songs like Hurts Me Too by Faye Webster? Won't you go play some of these songs and just lay in it? And this process was very, very, uh, 
difficult. And I might have even lost some friends through this. I don't even know. But I know that people were trying to talk to me and they were trying to help me. But I know also that as a soul and as a journey, I had to decipher, you know, reality from uh, fantasy. And I, I didn't really know how this was going to play out and I didn't know how to go about it but I've got a a good friend who's it's a a client actually um, who has become a good friend and we had brunch on a Sunday and she's a a psychotherapist Um, I think she does like somatic type therapy you know this whole body, this whole body thing is what was really tripping me out is how my body and my physical uh, senses were reacting. And we went and had brunch and she listened and she listened and she listened because she knew too. She knew, she knew about the real Helen. I mean, she knew that this was a life changing experience that I was going through. And so She listened and and I told her, you know, how I was dealing with it. And I was scared because I had started watching all these like documentaries and I was researching this, you know, uh, Nigerian online scamming group. And I, I researched it all the way to this group called the Black Axe. And it's it's based out of Nigeria, but it started way back in the, the 1950s. And when people, some of these people would uh, graduate with PhDs and masters and getting out of school, but there were no jobs. And it started this small little group of, of kind of like con artists. And they were figuring out ways to sort of start scamming because they had to make money. But this group, called Black Axe had been traced by the FBI uh, from a Canadian uh, group. Uh, There was a woman in Canada who actually committed suicide when something like this happened to her. And they found her in her car with a note. And they investigated it because it was a death. And they traced it back to Nigeria. And then I watched, uh, I watched a few things out of Australia, and there was one lady that was an actual naval officer. She'd been in the Navy for like 30 years. She was like an intelligence officer, smart as a whip. She had something like this happen to her, and she lost a million dollars. A million dollars! Had never met this man, but it was the same the same kind of thing, see? And I was listening and listening and I was identifying. Because here's the thing. I don't I don't watch news anymore. I don't watch uh, updates. I don't pay attention to stuff. I try not to pay attention to a bunch of negative shit. But I didn't know. I didn't even know what that term catfish meant. I didn't know anything about any of that. So this to me was like this whole new what in the world kind of moment. And I just kept investigating it. And I'm and I saw this one couple. It was a Nigerian couple. And they had actually like, you know, uh, deepened their voices and they were wearing masks and they were being interviewed on how they do this process. And. My therapist friend looked at me across the table and said, you know, whoever did this, they have to fall into character like an actor. It's it's like truly falling into a character, like when a person takes on a role in a, a movie or a play. And... That was the most the most baffling thing about it was the time. I thought how can how could a person 
keep up with this for this long, this many months, and all these hours in the day, you know, around every two hours, around the clock. It wasn't like once or twice a day. It was like I was in contact with my back pocket. I was having a love affair with my phone. I was having a love affair with the air. And and it was, uh, but it was just mind blowing because of the details. This was done with surgical precision. I went back over these texts and these emails with a fine tooth comb, and there is not one flaw. There is not one mishap. And she would even remind me of things. She would even remind me of things. Like, don't you remember, babe? I told you my sister's name was Flora. If I ask her anything twice, she would say, don't you remember? I told you that. She was on it. She was on top of it. She knew more about me than I knew about my fucking self. And that's what scared me was I've got a podcast out in the world. It's got everything about me. I mean, who cares, right? What kind of information do do they want, really and truly? It's all about money. You know, did she or they think that I had money? You know, maybe because I work so much. This was such a setup for such a long process. And I guess going for the gusto, you know, the more I learned about these scams was that uh, a scammer would usually start to ask for like a $500 upfront, whatever, you know, like a little piddly amount of money uh, to get that person sort of going. But there had never been a mention of Anything like that coming from Helena Greece. And I mean, it was like I thought that she was like the affluent one. And that's the way it appeared. And was about to become more affluent with the deal, right? And like I just, I felt like I was vying for acceptance from her. I felt like at some points that I was being uh, vetted so that I could be in their family, into the fold of the Achilles family. Achilles. I should have known by the name Achilles. Larissa Helen Achilles. Can it even get any more Greek than that? I mean, I just don't know. I must have said, I don't know, 400,000 times the first three days, four days of this. I kept, you know, watching these documentaries and these specials, just trying to understand. But I think there was a part of me that was trying to, um, I was trying to forgive myself, you know, on some level. I think I was trying to... um, to forgive myself for making this choice. Um, and also, you know, I know that this there's evil in the world and, you know, evil people do things to innocent people, all that. But I, I, I tend to go down to the next level with it for myself, which is the... I, I, I try to do the deep dive, the metaphysical dive of the deeper issue. And for me, I really and truly believe that I was trying to create the perfect relationship. Maybe I had affirmed it. I don't know. I knew that I wanted to do it different this time, like that song said. And I knew that I was, you know, really looking forward to uh, a whole new life. But I was really lost. I was very, very lost uh, for several weeks. 
And it's not something that can just leave. And I don't want to compare it to death, but it feels almost worse than a death because I just don't know who these people are and who is this beautiful woman in these pictures. That's what just blows me away. I have someone's entire photographic catalog in my phone. I'm in love with that person in that picture. I don't know who that is or where she is. And I want to know, see. I want to find her. It's, I'm sure it's a stolen identity. But part of me, I'm so fucked up with this that I want to find her and I want to say, Hey, is your name Helen? <laughs> It's so messed up. It's like I'm I'm really, I've been really struggling with shaking it. And so, Helena Grease, wherever you are, and if you're listening to this, then I told you I was going to put you in the podcast. After several weeks, I had time sort of to kind of get a little bit more grounded. And the anxiety remains in my body even to this day. I'm still struggling with a lot of anxiety around this issue. But um, I thought, okay, I have to figure out a way to put closure because... Finally, uh, I got an an email and it just said, I won't text you or call you any longer, but I'll keep your email. And so with that, I still had the email and I still had phone number, you know, but I I thought I'm not going to do anything. But then it dawned on to me, I need to put some closure on this. I really need to put some closure on it. And I did a voice recording, and I sent it. I emailed it. And in the voice recording, I talk about uh, a couple of red flags that I had in the beginning. And I kind of, you know, told Helen and Greece that I, I had some doubts, you know, in the beginning. And it was mainly because of my own self-worth. It wasn't because of any kind of real scam. It was kind of like, you know, is this person really going to like me? Or like I didn't want to say the wrong thing and all that. I just went on to say how this had, you know, evolved into a relationship for me and I I said how do you do it how did you do this I said you know if I if I ran into you with a cart a buggy at the grocery store you know you might be just some average looking woman buying some groceries and I'd have no idea what you did for a living and I just said you know I'm not mad at you and I don't really I don't hate and I don't I'm not, it's like I wasn't even angry about it. I wasn't even mad about it. I was, I was devastated, but I, I, I said, you know, Helen, this was the best relationship I've ever had in my whole life. You gave me what I was looking for. I said, you know, you mirrored me. You mirrored me a hundred percent. And I fell in love with that mirror. Does that mean that I fell in love with myself? Or did I fall in love with you? Did I fall in love with an energy? Did I fall in love with a vibrational set point? What did I fall in love with? Did I fall in love with deception? 
And I, I just, you know, I left this, this long, uh, and it was a stream of consciousness uh, voice recording, just like this podcast. It's all stream of consciousness. It's all just coming. I don't know where it comes from. It just comes from, I guess, that part of my brain or some other entity. I don't know what the fuck. It doesn't matter. But I wanted to put closure, and I thanked her. And I said, you know what, Helen? You showed me what I want. I already knew what I didn't want. I think most of us know what we want and what we don't want. And at 60 years old, I've had enough experiences to know what I don't want. But this experience gave me an entire relationship that I wanted. And I said, you know, I really wanted you to come and get me, Helen, and take me away from here. I wanted you to come on that white horse, any horse, a blonde horse, and take me away from here. And I wanted to go on that adventure. And I wanted to go to all those places. And I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn from you. You wanted to learn from me. You wanted to come and work with us. You wanted to work with the guys. She told us, she'd say, I want to work with y'all. Oh, this will be so much fun. Will you teach me, babe? Will you teach me how to, to use these chisels and hammers? I love these tools. She loved everything. Of course she did. It's okay. But you know what? If, if, if six or eight months had gone by, if a couple more months had gone by, I might have sent her the money. I was that convinced. I was that convinced that this person was real and was in my life and was coming home real soon to Charleston. And we were going to have dinner. And she was going to buy that Burberry London coat and those damn equestrian boots because when I told her that dream and I sent her a picture of what those two items look like, she says, oh, babe, I, you have such good taste. I love these. I will wear these for you. We had a plan, see. I had a plan. I had a plan with somebody. For the first time, I had a plan. And I was on board and 100% excited and 100% ready to go. And I wasn't going to throw caution to the wind and just run away. Because even Robbie, my client, the guy with the tattoos, I called him and I left him a voice recording. And I was really upset because you know what? I love that man. He's different. And I trusted him and I told him this. And he was devastated because he was even saying to me, you're going to go, aren't you? You're going to go, aren't you, girl? He goes, you need to, Jill. Jill, you need to. You got to. You got to go and travel and go do some stuff. You worked so hard. And he knew part of my story. He knew my loss. And uh, I just... Letting this go has been very hard. And it's, you know, I know I'm not a victim, but maybe I am a victim to, to this type of crime. But I, I don't, you know, you can't, I can't live in any kind of past stuff because it doesn't serve me because it's done. It happened and it's done. And I've got to find a solution. And I think that's what the biggest challenge has been because I don't have a reference point with something like this. And I don't have many people that know or that have anything like this. I have friends who have had deaths in their family or divorces that they've struggled. But this was not, this was unlike any kind of breakup even. 
and I've had some heartaches and some breakups in my life, but this even this even topped that. Uh, Eva texts me and asked me to go to the AA meeting the following Monday. And I went, and I met her there, and, uh, you know, I hung on through that hour, and it was kind of blurred. If, if I think back on it now, I can't really recall. It, the, the topic was acceptance, which was exactly what I needed to hear. But the biggest lesson, I guess, for me is to keep forgiving and I've got to forgive myself for you know making this choice and it's not wrong what I did it's not bad what I did you know and adults do meet on the internet and there are successful relationships that meet online you know, I can't judge this one experience and, and make that judgment for other people. But I got really fucking mad at fucking God. If there's a God. I felt like, is this another joke? Are you real? What the fuck do you want from me? Eva looked at me on my couch and said, maybe it's just bad luck. Maybe you just have bad luck. And is that true? Can we just have bad luck? Is that a thing? Like, is that real? Is bad luck a thing? I know that what we give energy to and what we think about, we create. I dig that. I got that. I understand that. I understand that we create our own reality. And I work very, very hard to get out in front of the negative. I've been working so hard for this last year, just extremely uh, staying in that that flow, staying in that positive flow and, and really trying to, you know, each day stay present, stay in the moment and stay in that higher flying vibration. And I have felt very good. I have had a great year. It's been very good. I've had, I've had a lot of experiences, and I've been up, and I've been, uh, you know, just better than I was for a long time. So you know, I don't know. I know that you know Pema Chodron wrote a book called When Things Fall Apart. I think she was like at home in Arizona and had this like kind of happy life or what she thought was happy and was out planting some flowers and her husband came home and said, you know, I want a divorce. I'm in love with somebody 25 years younger than you or something. I think that's how the story went. And, um, and she went down and, and I think, you know, I think that began her journey and I was like, okay, like, am I going to keep getting knocked down? Like, am I supposed to become like some kind of monk woman? You know, am I supposed to go just cut my hair off all short and wear that kind of red robe thing? What the fuck? I mean, this is the kind of stuff that goes through my mind. I mean, I'm telling the truth. You know, it's about let's tell the truth faster. Well, that's the truth. I just don't know. I've spent a lot of days and hours uh, talking to Helen because I felt like I had to embrace instead of block it out of my mind. If I block it out, you know, you think you're blocking something out, but you're just feeding it more attention by trying not to think about it. You're thinking about it more. And so I've had conversations just in the air because that's what she was anyway. And I started to realize maybe, 
just maybe because I remember these two photographs that I have of Helen. And I remember looking at them the day she sent them. And I zoomed in on her eyes and I said, there's a light in you. There is a light in you, Helen of Greece. And it kind of came to me, maybe Helen of Greece was God. Maybe that was God. Maybe that was the mirroring that I needed to learn how to love myself. Maybe through this crazy, insane, beautiful story, maybe the whole lesson was about being worthy being worthy of Helen of Greece, being worthy of myself. I know that more will be revealed. I don't really know what's next. It doesn't matter. I don't focus on it. I'm sad. I'm very sad that I didn't get to take this journey with Helen and and go to all those places with Helen and I could probably work it out one day where I might could go to some of these places but I don't even know if I would want to I think it's going to take some time you know to to heal this situation It's, it's a very, very interesting time. I'm leaving for Mexico on Sunday to go to my friend Janet's yoga retreat. And she wants me to do a workshop on storytelling. The name of it's Truth or Dare. Perfect timing. I probably won't share any of this. I probably won't even talk about it at all. But all I know is that 2021 into 2022, there were some months in Jill Haney's life that were happy. I was happy. I felt happy. And I felt hopeful. I think the saddest part of all for me is the hopefulness that I had. And it had been a very, very long time since I had had hope about my future. And uh, this just sideswiped me back into that hopeless feeling of uh, just desperation and despair. Not outwardly. I can go on. I can go do the fucking work. I can show up, laugh and talk and do what I got to do. But inside, I'm suffering. I'm hurting. It's like, a, it's like an ailment. You know, I'm going to have surgery on this finger when I get back from Mexico I'm hoping that maybe he'll just put me out and keep me out. (laughs) You know, maybe I could end the podcast by just, you know, hanging in my room in Mexico. But then Janet would have to, to finish the recording. No, I'm not going to do any of those things. It's just the things that go through my mind because pain is very hard sometimes to deal with. And sometimes I hate those fucking sayings, you know, pain is necessary, misery is optional. And I think that's bullshit. Pain is not necessary. That's one thing that I've learned over this, you know, (laughs) 
decades and decades is that it's not necessary. But I do feel like I can work on controlling my moods and I'll continue to get out in front of the low-flying problems and I'll continue to suit up and show up and, and help others and, uh, and just keep trying in the world. And maybe, you know, maybe by some strange force, maybe there's somebody out there that will listen to this story that had experienced this or maybe they're Helen maybe they're maybe they're doing the other end of it but maybe just maybe something can come out of this that would be a silver lining and the podcast you know it has brought a lot of good things into my life it you know people have reached out to me and told their truth and opened up and I know that it's touched people's lives and I'm so appreciative and grateful for all of your messages and emails. I know that I can't get back to everybody and I can't meet up with everybody and I can't hang out with everybody that's, you know, wants to or anything like that, but I just want to say that you know, I do love all of you out there that identify or that have gone through these struggles. Maybe things like this, maybe this truth-telling forum is a way that will start to help people to open so that we can start to heal, you know, as a, as a world globally not just in this country because the world is just fucked up but there's also a lot of good in the world because see you know the 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 earth is going to keep spinning and the planets are going to keep aligning and the sun's going to keep shining and all that stuff operates without a goddamn thing that we do we can't control any of that we have people that think they can, but they can't. And, you know, my lungs and my heart, those things work. And I don't have to push buttons. I don't have to think about it. I get up in the morning and those bodily functions and organs are working with no help from me. There's a divine force in this world, in this energetic field that is working behind the scenes. But you know what? It's not behind the scenes. It's in our fucking faces. Walk outside and see an, a rabbit run across your yard. There's stuff happening all the time that works in sync with each other. If we would get out of the way and just be the animals that we are. Because we are just mammals And we think we're so fucking cool. And we're just, you know, we're like an ant down in the ant hole with their fucking phone talking into it. Well, this ant right here has had about enough. I don't know. People do what they have to do, you know. People do what they have to do to survive. And uh, I can't, I can't judge. I just have to to keep forgiving and move forward without being a fucking doormat and without lashing out and just punching somebody in the face. I guess it's you know those stages of grief. Maybe I'm getting to the punch you in the fucking face part of grief, the anger part. I don't know. It doesn't matter anymore. But today is another day. And uh, that's all I'm going to say now. And 
more will be revealed. And when it is, you'll be the first to know about it. I'll tell you that much. Happy spring, everybody. I hope the Easter Bunny comes to see you. Hammered is recorded and produced in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. It's narrated by Jill Haney, produced by Maggie Briggs and Jill Haney, and with sound design, editing, and music by Alexander Rodriguez. Our beautiful artwork was created by Lauren Caddick, and we'd like to send a special thanks out there to Minnie and Robin. You can check out our website, podcasthammer.com, and follow us on social media for updates. <laughs>